So um, I will continue talking today about uh, valve stenosis as well as some uh, valvular regurgitation. Uh, I want to start with the Gorlin equation. This is a very important equation for you to know. And the concept is simple. If you want to remember, without knowing the full detail of the equation, just remember that Gorlin equation is flow across the valve divided by square root of gradient. So flow divided by square root of gradient. That's the gross idea of the Gorlin equation that was developed in the 50s, okay? So now I will dissect it a little more. So the actual equation is flow across the valve divided by a constant by square root of mean gradient. The key idea here is to understand the difference between a flow across the valve and cardiac output. Flow across the valve is not exactly the cardiac output. So imagine you have a cardiac output of five liter per minute. This five liter per minute is crossing the aortic valve during systole, not during one minute. So if in one minute you have 25 seconds of systole and 35 seconds of diastole, the flow across the valve is five liter, across the aortic valve is five liters per 25 seconds. That's the flow rate across the valve, okay? Therefore, the Gorlin equation becomes for the aortic valve, cardiac output divided by systolic time. So five liter per minute divided by 25 seconds per minute by square root of mean gradient. Then you further dissect the systolic time. So you can look at one minute of recording and see how much time is spent in systole in one minute and it can come out as 25 seconds, for example. Or you can measure it, extrapolate it from a beat. So the total systolic time per minute you can take it as a systolic time per beat, which is what we call SEP, systolic ejection period, multiply by the heart rate, okay? So this is a systolic ejection period that we use. It's basically the intersection. This is the LV and aortic pressure recording. It's the distance between the two points of intersection, okay? So that, that comes as the aortic valve area, cardiac output divided by heart rate by systolic ejection period by square root of mean gradient. The constant is 44.3 for the aortic valve. And you multiply by 1,000 to come out with the same units, liter here, milliliter in the bottom. So that's the aortic valve area. The mitral valve area is the same concept. It's cardiac output except it's divided by diastolic time, evidently instead of systolic time. Uh, that's when the cardiac output is crossing the mitral valve. And diastolic time to derive it from one beat, it's diastolic period, filling period of one beat multiplied by heart rate. And this is a diastolic filling period of one beat. Again, it's the intersection between LA pressure and LV pressure, the distance between those two points. So this is systolic ejection period. This is diastolic filling period. You're excluding the isovolumic contraction and relaxation times, okay? So the constant for the mitral valve area is a little less, 37.7, okay? So this is the true Gorlin equation. Again, if you want to remember it grossly, it's a flow across the valve divided by square root of mean gradient, added a few other uh, uh, minor, uh, components and constant, okay? Now, one important thing uh, that came out in the 1980 is a simple observation that those three, when you multiply those three and the thousand, they often cancel out. So those three here, the multiplication is often equal to a, th to a thousand. Same in mitral valve area, those three are often equal to a thousand. In the mitral valve, normally the diastolic time is longer than the systolic time, normally for normal heart rates. So the diastolic filling period is higher, but your constant for the mitral valve is lower. And therefore the same thing, that multiplication often end up being equal to this and equal to a thousand. So much so that the simplified Hackey equation came wherein the valve area is equal to cardiac output divided by square root of mean gradient. All the other four cancel each other out. And this is the Hacke equation. Cardiac output divided by square root of mean gradient. 
So Gordon equation is flow across the valve, which again is a little different than Karak output, divided by square root of mean gradient multiplied by a constant. Hackey equation is Karak output divided by square root of mean gradient. In the aortic valve, we use the mean gradient, but we can also use the peak to peak gradient, which as I explained last time, is usually approximately equal to the mean gradient. And I want you to remember this one. You need to know this equation. You need to plant it in your brain. So when you're doing a case, you can on the spot calculate what's the valve area. You see the gradient. You see, for example, an aortic valve, the peak to peak gradient. You see the Karak output. In your brain, you can calculate whether the, whether the valve area is less than one or over one. Okay? So please plant it in your brain. Karak output divided by square root of gradient. This simplified equation has not been well validated for a heart rate less than, a, less than 50 or over 100 or an atrial fibrillation, but I will go back to atrial fibrillation. Okay, any questions so far? I will describe two consequences, two very important consequences of this equation. Besides knowing the equation, making the math, it has implication for uh, hemodynamic understanding. So valve area per hacky equal Karak output divided by square root of pressure gradient. Flip it around and it becomes that pressure gradient equal Karak output square divided by valve area square, okay? That's an extremely important relationship here. That tells you that for the same valve area, if you double the Karak output, you're quadrupling the pressure gradient. If you're halving the Karak output, you're reducing the pressure gradient in four. Extremely important. That tells you why the pressure gradient is so dependent on Karak output, okay? For example, that explains, there are two consequences that come out of that particular relationship here, okay? So the first consequence is this. If you have a normal Karak output of 5.5 liter per minute and a valve area of one, aortic valve area of one, the gradient will come out as 27 and a half, 30, as I explained in the last talk. This by itself explains what we call the misalignment of the aortic valve area and gradient cutoff in the guidelines. Guidelines tell you AS is severe when aortic valve area is less than one, less than or equal to one, and the gradient is over 40. But inherently, there is misalignment in those guidelines. One corresponds probably to something close to 30 of gradient, not 40. Uh, that said, again, like I explained, the guidelines appropriately picked 40 because 40 is a very specific cutoff. If your gradient is over 40, you definitely have severe AS. But you can have a gradient of 30 and have severe AS with normal flow, not even a low output AS normal output, normal flow AS with a gradient of 30. Hence the importance sometimes of hemodynamic measurement and confirmation of valve area of one or less. So this is one consequence of that uh, equation, okay? That you can have, uh, you know, pressure gradient relatively low despite, uh, despite a normal Karak output. Another uh, important consequence of this is low output states. The that's the second consequence. So if you have somebody, imagine somebody with, again, valve area of one, but a very low Karak output at rest of three, three and a half. Well, his pressure gradient may end up being in the teens. So that can show you how you can have severe AS with a gradient in that 15 to 30 range. It's very rare, even in low Karak output, to have a gradient less than 15. But that exp explains to you why you can perfectly have, you can very well have a gradient, a mean gradient of 15, despite severe AS, if your Karak output is very low in the range of 3.5 or so. Okay? So those are two important consequences, the extreme flow dependence of the pressure gradient. Everybody understand this, uh, this concept? Maybe I can give you a third consequence of that, mixed aortic stenosis and aortic insufficiency. 
when you have aortic insufficiency with aortic stenosis, the flow across the valve will be potentially 50% or 100% higher. So you have higher flow across the valve, which will cause higher pressure gradient. Okay, it will increase the pressure gradient across the aortic valve for the same degree of stenosis. Okay. I hope everybody understood that flow dependence of, um, of, of uh, pressure gradients. So I will uh, detail now two uh, interesting pitfalls of valve area calculation. The first one I will discuss is atrial fibrillation, which I discussed to a degree last time. So hacky, as I mentioned, valve area calculation and atrial fibrillation can be difficult. And even though hacky equation has not been validated in atrial fibrillation, I actually think it's where it's most handy, as long as it's not a fast atrial fibrillation, as long as the average rate is about less than 110. Okay, now I mentioned, so let's say we have, let's take a case, we have an atrial fibrillation with a gradient less than, with a heart rate less than 100, 110. This is a case I've had. Uh, so I got you a tracing this time. So how do you calculate the pressure gradient in this patient? And how do you calculate the valve area? So I will go to a point I mentioned last time. What is the best uh, pressure gradient in this patient? His, his heart rate is, uh, the average heart rate is in the 80s. And those are the recording. So this is the LV pressure and this is the aortic pressure. The computer averaged the gradients across those uh, nine beats as, as is recommending in the guideline. They, they recommend you should average gradient from uh, five to 10 beats. So it averaged it as 30 millimeter of mercury. Do you think this is severe AS or not? I think we should get the the one with the highest cardiac output, which is going to be after the longest RR. Excellent, excellent. So that's the first important idea of this. Yes, atrial fibrillation is a low flow state for the reasons I explained last time. And therefore, don't average them in my opinion. Take the highest gradient to try to gauge the severity of the aortic stenosis. And you can see there are beats where the aortic valve gradient may be 25 millimeter of mercury, such as this one after a short RR, especially long short RR interval. But take the long RR and here you have a gradient of about 40. Remember every uh, box here is 20 millimeter of mercury. So the peak to peak gradient here is 40. Uh, same here, this one, peak to peak is a little over 40, a little over 40 here. In this beat, it's almost actually 60. So you should absolutely take the highest gradient, which in this case is ranging between 40 to 60 millimeter of mercury. Therefore, this is severe aortic stenosis. Don't average like the computer did. So that's one answer. I think it's severe AS. Second is the morphology. Look at this morphology. This is as severe AS as you can get. Look at this very slow upstroke that I described last time, slow upstroke very non-parallel to the LV upstroke. Also, you can see the acrotic notch. The tracing may be a little bit damped, but you can clearly see here an anacrotic notch, which is that bend on the upstroke. You go up, then you bend, and you become even more sluggish after that anacrotic notch. You see an anacrotic notch here as well, here. So you see an acrotic notch. You see an attenuated dicrotic notch too. So this is definitely severe AS in my opinion. Okay, so we determined that severe AS by gradient, by taking the highest gradient. Okay, the second step is how to calculate the valve area. And here is where hack, in my opinion, is uh, very handy. So what I do here, we, we take the cardiac out, we measure the cardiac output by thermodilution, and it's tricky in AFib, as I explained in a prior talk but we keep trying to do cardiac output by thermodilution until we get three values within 25% of each other. We average those three values. And that's the best cardiac output you can get in atrial fibrillation, knowing that there is variability in flow depending on when you're capturing 
uh, the flow with your thermodilution injection, okay? So we try to average three within 25% of each other, and we try to make at least five measurements. So after we get that correct output, then we can apply the Hackey equation. As long as, again, your heart rate, your average rate is less than 110. So correct output divided by square root of the mean or peak to peak gradient. Now here is controversial. Should you use the highest peak to peak gradient or should you use the average peak to peak gradient? In theory, for the valve area calculation, it's probably best to use that one, the 30 the average peak to peak or the average mean gradient, not the highest gradient, simply because the correct output you're plugging in that equation is an average correct output. You know, average correct output, you should get probably the average gradient from multiple beats. It is debatable. There is, there is no definite answer. I wouldn't mind applying the highest gradient. Again, I'm trying, I don't care exactly about what, what the valve area is exactly. I care about determining whether it's in the severe range or not, okay? So that's a summary of how we do it in atrial fibrillation. Everybody understand those concepts? Another concept uh, that comes up, uh, also an application of the uh, valve area calculation is this. You have somebody with mixed aortic stenosis and aortic insufficiency that looks at least moderate on the echo. And you're doing, um, you're doing a hemodynamic assessment. So the mean aortic valve gradient is 36 millimeter of mercury, and the cardiac output measures as 4.5 liters per minute. What is the valve area? Again, I want you to be able to plug in that equation in your brain very quickly. So what is the valve area? Here, if I'm on the spot, let's imagine myself a fellow, I would say, okay, it's cardiac output divided by square root of mean gradient. So 4.5 divided by six, it will be less than one, okay? But there is a caveat here because this is the problem. It's mixed ASAI. What's the caveat when I'm applying Hackey or Gorlin with a mixed ASAI? This is the caveat, is that the cardiac output you're getting by thermodilution or FIC is the net cardiac output. But when you have mixed ASAI, the flow or the cardiac output per minute across the valve is higher than the net output. For example, the heart is pumping 150 milliliter stroke volume, but only half of it is making it to the peripheral circulation as being measured uh, by FIC or thermodilution. Therefore, the flow across the valve is if it is severe AI, is usually at least double the cardiac output because half, half of the cardiac output is going backward. So the flow across the valve will at least double this in severe AI and at least one and a half times this in moderate AI. So you have to account for this. So when you have AI that's at least moderate, don't just do 4.5 divided by square root of this. It's hard to tell how much the cardiac output will be or the flow across the valve will be but you can probably multiply it if it is severe by echo probably, or by aortic angiography. You can multiply it by two. If it is moderate, you can multiply it by one and a half to get an idea. It's not an accurate measurement, okay? But I do want to highlight this, even though I like to talk about it and I like you to understand the equation, you do need to know that guidelines give a class one recommendation for valve surgery in symptomatic moderate AS, moderate AI, mixed moderate AS AI. That's about the only moderate valve disease that gets a class one recommendation for surgery, okay? It's mixed moderate AS and AI, moderate single valve disease. Uh, the idea is that because each one of them aggravates the hemodynamic consequence of, of the other and you end up with a hemodynamic picture that is as bad as severe AS or severe isolated AI. And that's why in that case, you know, the gradient of, even though the gradient is exaggerated, the AS gradient, you know, for, a, for an AS valve area of 1.5, you can have a gradient of 40 because of the AI. That 40 still correlates with the hemodynamic severity of the mixed AS AI. It's telling you how much 
that AS is creating, that AI is creating flow across a moderate AS. And eventually it correlates with how much that ventricle is having to work hard. And it correlates with symptoms and with the need of surgery. So even though I explain how to do it and not to report it erroneously, it's probably a moot point. In mixed AS AI, you just have to tell how severe AI is and the mean gradient or peak to peak gradient by itself correlates with the hemodynamic severity of the combination more than valve area by itself. That's the only case where gradient is probably um, even more important than the valve area in AS severity assessment. All right, did everyone get those points? I will move to mitral stenosis, okay? This is the basic recording. So I described uh, last time the aortic valve stenosis, which is a simultaneous recording of LV pressure and aortic pressure. And you see a gradient between them in systole. Now, mitral stenosis is seen on a simultaneous recording of LA pressure and LV pressure in diastole. Whenever you analyze simultaneous recording, whether LV aorta or LV LA, always look in systole what's happening and diastole what's happening. So for LA LV, which is this LA LV, mitral stenosis is assessed in diastole. And this is how it is normally in diastole for LA LV. LA has a slight gradient in very early diastole around the Y descent, has a very slight uh, gradient between LA and LV in early diastole. Then LA immediately meets the LV, and this is what we call diastasis, okay? There is no gradient in mid to late diastole between LA and LV. This is MS, and this is the hallmark characteristic of mitral stenosis in hemodynamics, invasive hemodynamics, is that the LA never touches the LV at a relatively controlled heart rate, less than 75 to 80 beats per minute. So there is no LA, LV diastasis at a controlled heart rate, less than 75 to 80. Look, they don't touch each other, even in end diastole. Or, or one easier way of expressing it, LA, LV do not touch even in end diastole, despite a controlled heart rate. This is an illustration of that, okay? So again, I want your eyes to practice. This is the LV pressure. We're not seeing the systole of the LV. We're seeing here just the diastole uh, based on that magnified uh, scale. So this is the diastolic LV pressure, and this is your wedge pressure here. We use wedge pressure as a surrogate of LA pressure, although I will explain the caveats of that in a minute. So you can see that this wedge pressure does not touch the LV in end diastole, despite a very well controlled uh, heart rate, less than 75, 80, okay? So this is by itself is suggestive of severe mitral stenosis. Without calculating valve area and without calculating gradient, just this finding alone suggests severe mitral stenosis, okay? There are other findings on this that suggest severe MS. Anybody can point to another finding on this, suggestive of severe MS? Maybe some of the higher uh, level fellows? There's a finding I really like, which is this one. LA V wave may be prominent and is often prominent in mitral stenosis, yet LV A wave is discrepantly absent. Look at that A wave. It's trying to push flow across the obstructed mitral valve, but the LV is still not seeing much flow. So you get that big discrepancy between big A wave on the LA, but no, L no A wave on the LV. So you get big LA A wave, yet no S4. Big LA A wave on the LV would be S4, but you have no S4 in mitral stenosis, okay? That's a hallmark finding that I very much like, that discrepancy, okay? Another finding is a mean gradient more than five, despite a heart rate less than 80, okay? So we have those findings. This is significant mitral stenosis. Unlike aortic stenosis, where we just, we can take peak to peak, it's easy for us on the spot to get what the gradient is. Mitral stenosis, it's harder on the spot to get the gradient. I sometimes 
pick the middle area and find the highest kind of peak to peak gradient in the middle area. And I use that as a mean gradient on the spot. Uh, the best way of course, is what you do uh, after you post process it by measuring the area under the curve, that area between the two curves and the integral of that area is the mean gradient. One other equation published in CCI in 2007 is they take mean LA pressure minus half of the LVDP, and that gives them the mean valve gradient as well. But I generally tend to go by this in the middle, the highest point in the middle as the mean gradient. But the best is again to post process it at the end. And importantly, you don't even need that. You just need those two features I described, no diastasis and discrepancy between LAA wave and LVA wave. Okay. Now there are, of course, uh, some caveats here. If you, even if you have somebody with a severe MS and severe MS is defined as mitral valve area less than 1.5, very severe MS less than one. So if you have somebody with severe MS with a valve area between one and 1.5, if you slow him down enough, less than 60 beats per minute, or if you cause a long pause, over a second or a second and a half, you can achieve diastasis. So look at this patient, it's not the best tracing, I agree here, but still you have no diastasis here, no diastasis here. Again, this is LA pressure, this is LV pressure. Look at, for example, this area. You have big A wave, minimal, no LV A wave or minimal one here, and you have no diastasis. So this is significant MS for sure. But if you give them long enough pause, those two will eventually meet. So having diastasis after a long pause or at a heart rate less than 60 beat per minute does not exclude severe MS, MS mitral stenosis. Uh, so, you know, the gradient and those ideas are very dependent in mitral stenosis on the heart rate, very dependent. And that's why eventually the calculation of valve area in mitral stenosis is very important because the gradient is so dependent on flow conditions. Conversely, the worst caveat of this, and the one I see more often, is you take somebody who has no mitral stenosis or mild mitral stenosis, let's say mild mitral stenosis with a valve area of two, you make him fast at 100 beats per minute, he will have something like this. So mild mitral stenosis that is fast over 80, 85 beats per minute, you will have no diastasis and you may have discrepancy between LV and LA, but it's really a mild anatomic MS that is made hemodynamically, physiologically severe by tachycardia and high flow rate, okay? Tachycardia shrinks diastole and forces more flow per second in diastole. So therefore you will increase the gradient because you're increasing diastolic flow. So, that's why uh, mitral uh, gradient and the assessment of lack of diastasis is very dependent on heart rate, more so in MS than in aortic stenosis. That's why it's more important even in mitral stenosis to calculate mitral valve area. Uh, and it's, it's very important because again, the gradient is so dependent on flow conditions and on heart rate, much more than aortic stenosis. Which brings the echo caveat. Echo is great at getting the gradient, but it's horrible at getting the valve area, absolutely horrible. And that's why it's not uncommon, it's not uncommon than on echo when you have high gradient, but not clear valve area, you may need hemodynamic assessment to measure that mitral valve area, okay? And to look at those characteristic under controlled heart rate to confirm the severity. So you understand that that is the first caveat of mitral stenosis assessment hemodynamically is, that is it's extreme dependence on heart rate. If your heart rate is good below this, you're good. If it is above that, then we're, we have a problem. So that's, we have a problem, but the valve area will bail you out, calculation of the valve, mitral valve area. There's a second big caveat, and that's the biggest caveat I see is using wedge pressure as a surrogate of LA pressure. And here I want you to understand that extremely well, because that's an idea that, will, that we will use every day. 
What's the difference between left atrial pressure and wedge pressure? So left atrial pressure gets transmitted through the pulmonary veins and the pulmonary venules and uh, micro arteries into your wedge catheter. Through that transmission between LA to the wedge catheter, you get damping. You're getting damped through that, the pulmonary circuit, the LA pressure gets damped. The more that circuit is vasoconstricted and small and diseased, for example, in pulmonary arterial hypertension, the more damped is the transmission between LA and wedge pressure. So this is how LA pressure is. This is the V wave. This is the A wave. This is how the wedge pressure will be. Imagine that LA pressure take the ends of it and elongate it, elongate it this way and that way. That's how the wedge pressure is. It's a damped LA pressure. And this is an extra damp. The degree of damping can vary. Extra damp. It's, so, so what happens, the area under the curve is much different in wedge pressure versus LA pressure. The mean is generally the same. So wedge pressure is still a good correlate of mean LA pressure, a good correlate of pulmonary edema and heart failure decompensation, but it's not a good correlate of the exact LA pressure. And this is the most important. I really want you to memorize that figure, okay? I have it in my book. It's a very important figure. So we're measuring, this is a patient with severe mitral regurgitation or severe heart failure with a big V wave. So this is the LA V wave and this is the LV pressure. You have an early gradient in, in diastole, that early gradient between LA and LV is actually what we call the E wave on echo. That's the early diastolic gradient. It's a big E wave, but the LA and LV meet quickly in mid diastole, okay? Now imagine here doing a wedge pressure. There are, this is the first caveat I described. It is much more damped. Compare this, how sharp, this is much more damped. And it's also delayed because of that retrograde transmission, wedge pressure is delayed. Now you can shift the wedge pressure backward to account for that delay in transmission. You usually shift it until the V wave is bisected. Normally the V wave is bisected by the LV descent, okay? So you shift it until that V wave is almost bisected or a little or slightly precedes the LV descent. The problem, you're not going to account for that damping of pressure. So you'll create a fake gradient. Compare this to that. You're creating a fake, huge gradient. The larger your V wave, the faker the gradient you'll create by using a wedge pressure, okay? The more erroneous is that comparison between LA, LV, and wedge LV pressure, okay? So... Did everybody understand that? Why wedge pressure is a poor correlate for LA pressure in mitral stenosis assessment? This is a case, you know, I'll show you a few examples here, but this is a case of pure mitral regurgitation. The patient did not have mitral stenosis at all. So this is the L wedge pressure, look at it. And this is the LV pressure. In diastole, it may look to you, especially on this beat, that there is no diastasis and there is a mitral gradient. But if you look more carefully, there is a hint. You have diastasis at time, which makes no sense. It, it implies that there is no significant valvular impedance. So that's already a hint to the problem, okay? Uh, anyway, the true LA pressure is something like this on this patient. There is absolutely no gradient between LA and LV, whereas the wedge pressure created a fake gradient. And one of the reasons it created that fake gradient is that you have big V wave. The more, the bigger your V wave, the faker that wedge pressure gradient becomes, okay? So I hope everybody understands that. Uh, and I want to mention another idea. This is a case that I've had 10 years ago that I remember very well. This is a guy who's 70 years old. All, he keeps coming with decompensated heart failure very functionally limited. All his echoes are read as significant mitral stenosis. He had heavy MAC and subvalvular calcium. So we did wedge pressure LV recording on him and look, it looks like he has, he has atrial fibrillation by the way too, but it looks like he has uh, mitral stenosis. He has no diastasis in end diastole. And uh, the scale here is 20 millimeter of mercury here. 
So it looks like he has no diastasis at a controlled heart rate. So it fit with mitral stenosis. But that was horrible because we did an invasive measurement of LA pressure with the LV. And look at that. Look at the huge gradient you're creating with the wedge pressure versus the true gradient or lack thereof gradient with LA LV. They meet in mid early diastole. This is the LA. It has a big V wave because he's in the compensated failure, but he has no gradient except, you know, early diastole, which is expected when you have a big V wave, but you meet in mid and late diastole. This patient had absolutely no MS. Eventually that tracing helped us look for other causes of heart failure. This guy had amyloidosis, but that echo and that obsession with MS ended up being a big distraction on this patient. So really don't use wedge pressure. If, you, if your echo is inconclusive in terms of MS, you need to do transseptal puncture and measure direct LA pressure with LA-LV. If your echo is on, inconclusive, well, definitely your wedge pressure LV will be even more inconclusive. That's not the way to study mitral stenosis in inconclusive cases, okay? And I do want to mention this idea regarding also fake mitral stenosis by cath and by echo is that MAC, mitral annular calcification. These days we have older population and we have echoes that are frequently misread as MAC with moderate or severe mitral stenosis or the term that I absolutely hate, moderate to severe mitral stenosis with MAC. Most often that's incorrect. If you want to close your eyes, not look at the echo, and make a guess, it's most likely incorrect. This patient most likely doesn't have mitral stenosis when it is MAC with moderate to severe mitral stenosis by echo. Simply because of this, MAC often doesn't cause mitral stenosis. Look at rheumatic MS. Rheumatic MS, the leaflet tips are restricted and tied together, particularly at the commissures, leading to a funnel-shaped stenosis. Uh, this creates valvular impedance. Conversely, in MAC, the obstruction is outward at the leaflet base with a relatively unrestricted tip motion and minimal valvular impedance, okay? The problem is that MAC patients who are old frequently have diastolic dysfunction, frequently have uh, some degree of MR, frequently have atrial fibrillation, all of which increase E-wave and V-wave by cath. V-wave by cath, and E-wave on echo. So when those arise, when the E-wave is high by echo, you will get, some people will misread it. Oh, well, it's a big E-wave. They measure it. They trace the E-wave and they measure it as a pressure gradient. But that is incorrect. That is not a pressure gradient. It's actually more common to have mitral regurgitation with MAC than to have mitral stenosis. And, and this is an invasive, and I love this, this tracing. Uh, this is an invasive interpretation of MAC MS versus rheumatic MS and echocorrelation. So this is a patient with true MS, again, LA pressure recording, LV pressure. Look at that, a huge gradient in diastole. Absolutely no diastasis, discrepancy between LA A wave and LV A wave. Big gradient, okay? Conversely, Look at that patient with MAC MS. He has, well, he has the same LA pressure in, in mean value. It is a high LA pressure, but it's a different LA pressure. And look at the LV, the LV pressure is high as well, okay? So this patient with MAC MS has some degree of transvalvular gradient, but the LA pressure height is more driven by the LA illness itself. Look at that, a huge V wave. That's what's driving the LA um, pressure. It's a huge LA V wave, which is driven by the poor LA compliance and atrial fibrillation. Also the LV pressure is high. He has impaired LV compliance. And the difference between LA and LV is not that high. So this patient's high LA pressure is driven by an ill and sick LA and a sick LV not so much a sick mitral orifice, okay? And therefore you get quick decay of the pressure gradient. And on a slightly increased RR interval, you actually have diastasis and diastole. 
And this is what you get by echo. In this patient, you get that very slow decay on echo of the E wave, whereas in, whereas in this one, even though you may have a very tall E wave because of the big V wave, you have a quick decay. And even though that area may measure as mean gradient over five, this is not significant MS. If you take the other feature, the decay, and if you take the hemodynamic measurement and diastasis. So I hope everybody understood that. You can have big V wave in mitral stenosis. Normally not as high as you get in mitral regurgitation. But the caveat and the difference is this, this big area and the lack of diastasis. Also notice here, big LAA wave, no LVA wave, which again fits with mitral stenosis. So I threw a lot of mitral stenosis ideas at you. I hope you understand the caveat. I want you to remember, do simultaneous LA and v, LV in uh, questionable cases of mitral stenosis. That's one idea. Uh, don't rely on the wedge pressure. Understand the caveat of the wedge pressure. Two, understand the extreme dependence of mitral gradient uh, it's extreme dependence on flow condition and heart rate, particularly when you're doing it by echo. And therefore, in those cases, you may need catheterization using transeptal LA measurement to measure the true valve area in this patient and to look at the hemodynamic uh, features I described, the lack of diastasis, the discrepancy between LV and LA A wave. Okay. Did everybody understand that? And the caveat, the third big caveat, the MAC caveat. All right, I will move to one more topic here and then I will stop. So this is a different topic. I'm not talking about mitral stenosis anymore. What is this? What is the diagnosis on this tracing? And in order to answer that, you have to think, what is this tracing? And what is the, uh, what does it imply? Good answer, Vic answered mitral regurgitation. Now, why is that? So I want you to know the first part of the question. What is this tracing? Is this, could this be PA pressure? Could it be RV pressure? Or is it wedge pressure or LA pressure? Let's call them here, um, left atrial pressure. So I want you to know, even though this is a high pressure, the, the peak reaches 70 millimeter of mercury, some may be inclined to call this RV pressure or to call it PA pressure. But always when you're confused about the tracing, there are several features to look at. But the very first feature is always look at the interval between the peaks. That's the very first step. If the interval between peaks is upsloping or horizontal, this is not an arterial tracing. So this is how, this is a PA pressure. This is how PA pressure looks like. It is downsloping in diastole with a, with a diacrotic notch, but it is downsloping. PA and aortic, arterial pressure, downsloping. Atrial and ventricular pressures are upsloping in diastole with an A wave, if you don't have, particularly if you don't have atrial fibrillation. So upsloping with an A wave. So that's the first thing you look at. So when you look at this, you see upsloping with A wave, this is not arterial pressure. And if your catheter is in the PA and you're seeing this, well, you know, okay, well, this is a wedge pressure. This is not a PA pressure, okay? Well, it's a wedge pressure that is a huge with a huge V wave. This is A wave after P, and this is V wave peaks after T. So it's a wedge pressure with a huge V wave of 70 millimeter of mercury. This is indicative of severe mitral regurgitation, okay? So does everybody understand the difference? There is another difference, but again, I want you to remember that one between the peak upsloping plus or minus A wave. That's the most important thing that hints to you for atrial or in context ventricular recording. Now there are other features you can look at. The peak morphology, look at this. An atrial pressure with a big V wave is peaky looking, compare this to the arterial pressure. This one is peaky, it's very narrow, and it tends to be late peaky because it peaks later than this. It peaks after T, whereas this peaks during T. So it's late peaky. It generally has 
slow up slope and sharp down slope. So late peaky with a sharp down slope, unlike the sharp up slope in arterial pressure. So that's another feature that helps you, late peaky morphology compared to the arterial tracing. That's another case that I had actually during fellowship, but I love it. Uh, this is somebody with massive matter regurgitation. The V wave here is over 50. This is the PA pressure in that same patient. Interestingly, the V wave is even higher than, than systolic PA pressure in that patient. It's amazing. But look at this. One can get fooled. When you look at that, you, one can think, oh, this looks like a PA pressure. But again, the timing, it's late peaky compared to this. It is peaking around T wave. This peaks after T wave. And the morphology has a late peaky morphology, not a broad morphology. That's one. Two, like I explained, the interval between segments. This is down sloping between the peaks. This is horizontal between the peaks. It's under damped. We don't see a wave clearly here, but we can see clearly that it's horizontal or upsloping. It's not down sloping between peaks. Therefore, this is a true wedge pressure with a massive V wave and indica indicative of mitral regurgitation. Okay. In suspicious cases or questionable cases, always verify. You can confirm this is wedge pressure by the, the ultimate confirmation methodology of wedge pressure is to draw wedge sat, which I frequently do with you when I do the uh, cardiac cath. So we can draw wedge sat. And when the wedge sat is within 5% of the arterial O2 sat, uh, then in the absence of a right to left chunk, then this wedge sat uh, is indeed a true wedge, confirms that this is indeed a true wedge. I will show another application. I, I do want to plug this in your heads the shape of LA pressure or wedge pressure with a high V wave. Again, you look at this tracing, it looks you know, like a ventricular tracing. It's, the peak pressure is 60. It looks like an RV with an A wave. Or it, for some, it could even mimic a PA pressure. But again, the difference, one, you're upsloping in the acid with A wave. That tells you it's not arterial. It could be RV, but it's not arterial. Upsloping between the peak, it's not arterial. Two, it's late peaky. It's not a plateau, unlike a ventricle or an aortic. It's late peaky after the T wave. The peak is after the T wave. And it's slow upslope, sharp downslope. This was actually direct LA pressure in a patient uh, with severe MR undergoing mitra clip. Here I got you a simultaneous LA LV recording to show you again the difference in morphology. Uh, it is the tracings are damps, but I still it still makes my point. So uh, it's very the tracings are very smooth. That's why I call them damped. You don't see a wave, you don't see dips. It's very smooth, damped. But still, it shows the features I want to show, which is one in between in diastole between the peaks. You're horizontal, unlike an arterial tracing. Two, the timing of the peak. The LV peaks throughout the T wave, throughout systole, whereas the V wave peaks at the very end, slow upslope, sharp downslope, and it's actually bisected by the descent of the LV. So you see this tracing, even without timing to the EKG, you see a tracing that is late peaking, bisected by the LV descent. This is an atrial tracing. This is not arterial. This is not LV RV. This is not LV aortic. This is LV atrial tracing, LA tracing in this case, in a patient with severe MR and a V wave of 60 millimeter of mercury. By the way, this patient had severe MR from MAC to show you, you know, we do see if, uh, not infrequently severe MR from MAC. It's MS with MAC that's uncommon. All right. So did everybody understand that tracing? Review those. At your, in your own private time. And I think try to plug all those tracing in your mind. That's why I give you a lot of tracings so you can keep applying them and analyzing them. I will finish with this idea. What is, I mentioned a lot in that talk, large V wave, but what is a large V wave? What's the definition of a large V wave? And what's the most common cause of a large V wave? So I hope everybody knows the definition of a large V wave. 
there are three definitions. One is extreme, over two times the mean wedge pressure. The other two are the ones I use, we use more often, more than 10 millimeter higher than the mean. So you look at the mean wedge pressure, which is, for example, in this case, um, around uh, 35, um, or sorry, is around 30 millimeter of mercury. And if your V wave is higher, 10 millimeter or more higher than the mean, it's a big V wave. That's the more commonly met definition. Another definition is a V wave in absolute value over 40, okay, which will be here on this scale. The third and ultimate definition is a V wave that is more than twice the mean wedge pressure. That is uh, more difficult to meet, and usually you meet that with severe massive mitral regurgitation, okay? The other two can be met in other conditions. So you got the three definition over 40 in absolute value or 10 millimeter over the mean watch pressure. That's how we define high uh, large V wave or more than twice, two times the mean that becomes more specific for mitral regurgitation. So what are the most common, what is the most common cause of a large V wave? Pick one cause. What is the single most common cause of a large V wave? Decreased atrial compliance. Yes, and give me a clinical uh, so, situation. Uh, acute decompensated heart failure. Excellent. Uh, or uh, acute uh, valvular regurgitation, mitral regurgitation, or volume overload from acute VSD or something. Something that happens acutely, Ooh. overwhelming the compliance of the atrium. Excellent, excellent answer. That's perfect. So yes, anything that overwhelms the atrial compliance will cause a large V wave. Uh, more than half the time, probably around 50 to 60% of large V waves are not mitral regurgitation. They are most commonly decompensated left heart failure, okay? In which case the left atrial, you have volume overload and high venous return that overwhelms the left atrial and left ventricular compliance and causes the large V wave, okay? This is how V wave is in normal states and in compensated LV dysfunction. When you're decompensated, both the LV pressure rises, but the wedge pressure and LA pressure can rise furthermore as that left atrial pressure gets overwhelmed. V wave equal left atrial compliance overwhelming. Okay, so decompensated heart failure is the most common cause of uh, large V wave. Uh, as Ahmed mentioned, ventricular septal uh, defect or rupture can cause a very large V wave. Mitral stenosis can cause V wave. I mentioned, look here, there is somewhat pronounced V wave. Um, hey, this one wasn't, but here, this patient has true mitral stenosis and he has a somewhat pronounced V wave. Again, because of mitral stenosis, depending on the degree of mitral stenosis, particularly end stage, your left atrial compliance will be overwhelmed and V wave will become uh, pronounced, okay? In, in mitral stenosis, you get, generally speaking, you get pronounced A wave and V wave. A wave, you get it early in mitral stenosis stages. V wave, you get it more in the late stages of mitral stenosis, once, once that left atrium is very fibrotic and non-compliant. This is an additional case of a large V wave in a patient without severe mitral regurgitation. This is a dialysis patient with atrial fibrillation and severe diastolic heart failure. Note the very large V wave. It exceeds uh, 40, 45 millimeter of mercury. This patient absolutely has no mitral stenosis or mitral regurgitation. The large V wave is due to severe diastolic heart failure but also to atrial fibrillation. And I want you to remember the importance of atrial fibrillation in exaggerating V wave. Atrial fibrillation exaggerates V wave as the atrium does not get a chance to empty via atrial contraction, which builds the pressure into V wave. This case is somewhat similar to the MAC case I showed a little bit earlier. This is the MAC case I showed earlier. This patient has no mitral regurgitation he has severe diastolic heart failure and MAC with atrial fibrillation, which is generating that very large V wave. Thank you for attending.